Hi there. I'm Nancy from Black Sheep Knitting in Needham, Massachusetts. We're a local yarn shop and we um, produce this podcast once a week and we try to answer questions. We try to show you new things that are exciting us, new yarns in our shop, new projects, tips and tricks. So we, um, and we love to answer questions. So we, I'm going to answer some questions that some of you had. Um, but first I'd like to just um, mention that we're thinking about the people in Israel and what's going on there. And in light of that, um, or related to that, are also the people in Ukraine. And someone came into the shop the other day and from an organization called RememberUs.org. They formed in 2013 I think when Crimea, the, there was the war in Crimea. And what they do is send things to help the people in those countries. So we are going to help them send knitted items to Ukraine. And I think they help, I don't know whether it's 150 families a month or a year, or it, but it's some large numbers of families who really appreciate getting these lovely knitted items. So what we'd like to collect are um, newly knitted items that are clean and that are made by you or friends or whomever, but or something that you made you didn't like, you didn't fit you, whatever. We are looking for baby items, you know, sweaters, hats, socks, um, anything, blankets, anything that you can think of for babies and also then for kids and adults. Any knit on, knitted item, uh, scarves or hats or cowls or even a sweater. Um, so anything that you can think of or you can make knitted toys. You know, a knitted toy is always a, a great thing. So we're going to collect those here in the shop. Um, and you can come in. We have Friday afternoon knit-alongs. If you want to come in and work on something on a Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, we love having people. We're, Agnes is still working, actually, on the tessellated sweater for Rhinebeck, so she'll be here this Friday. It's the last Friday. She'll be here working on it, so do come in. But anyway, um, back to the um, knitted things for to donate. We'll be collecting them until November 30th, and then they'll go on a shipment. Um, I'm not sure how they do it, or I don't know all the particulars. Um, but if you want to look up um, their organization, it's called RememberUs.org. So we'll look forward to getting things from people. So we asked several weeks ago for you to, um, in the comments in our videos, to ask us questions. And we've, we've been a little busy, so we didn't get to it right away, but we are going to, we're committed to answering your questions. So if you've asked a question and we haven't answered, you can also remind us, but I think we have it under control now. So this is the first question I'm going to tackle today. And it's, my question is, there's, are there certain skills in knitting that should be mastered to become a master knitter? Well, that's a loaded question, if I ever heard one. Because a master knitter, there is a, um, what would you call it? I think it's the Knitting and Crochet Guild. One of them has a master knitter program. And you can do their whole program. I think it takes a long time to do it. And it's like knitting all kinds of things and swatches and, you know, an amazing amount of work to be what they call a master knitter. But what I would call a master knitter or someone who's a good knitter, is someone who um, can read a pattern um, and can tackle just about any pattern that they see, who reads patterns well. If you can knit evenly and if you are good at casting on and binding off and um, Let's see, what else? I had them all. I should have written them all down. But you really need to be a confident knitter. That makes you a really 
masterful knitter, uh, you need to be able to recognize mistakes and know how to fix them. That's critical. And um, I think I'm going to do, that said, I think I'm going to do a fixing your mistakes um, or a tips and tricks workshop pretty soon. So look for that um, to come up. But I think being confident to be able to tackle anything that you see and to do it well. Finishing is a really important part of becoming masterful at this. You need to be able to do seams. You need to be able to do really good cast-ons and bind-offs. Um, a lot of people misunderstand that your bind-off, the bottom of your bind-off and the beginning of your cast-on need to feel like the rest of the fabric. And you can ruin a beautiful knit by having the bind off too tight. So if you can't stretch it in the same way that you stretch your fabric, you need to start over and find a stretchy bind off. Um, you need to have skills like Kitchener stitch, which I'm going to demonstrate in a few minutes, um, doing short rows. So I've seen people who within we had someone, I think I mentioned this last week, somebody who came in and her second project was a color work sweater and it was gorgeous. So there are people who are always going to be better than others. But I would say, you know, if you're not particularly good at something, practice at it. You know, practice and learn to read patterns, learn to read charts. That's a really important thing. So our next um, question is, any tips on making a neater edge when working in garter stitch? Well, I answered this person, um, I think, and then I thought about it for a minute and thought, well, the answer I gave was not fully formed um, or it wasn't complete. So my suggestion was to do a stockinette stitch on either edge, which would mean on one side you always knit the beginning stitch and the end stitch, and on the opposite side you always purl those two stitches, the beginning stitch and the end stitch. And what that will do is give you a stockinette edge, a nice edge. There are a couple other things you can do. Um, and if you, because the pattern you're doing might not look right with that stock, I was thinking in terms of a piece that you might be seaming, and that would give you a perfect place to do the seam and make the edge neat. But if you want a neat edge, it's because that's an exposed edge, um, which is what I thought about after I answered that question. If we're on a blanket or a scarf, because I, um, I love a garter stitch scarf or a garter stitch blanket. But what you have to do at the end of the row when you do that last stitch, make sure you give it a little tug when you turn it around to go the other way. When you make that stitch, just give it a tiny bit of a tug. So those two things on the beginning and the end of your um, garment will tighten up and neaten up that edge. The other thing that people do is they slip the first stitch um, and that gives you a neater edge. It's only that first stitch, it's not the end stitch, but just slip that first stitch and that will neaten both sides of your, um, of your piece. So that, I hope that answers um, our question. Um, so here's an interesting one. When is it okay to substitute a different cast on or cast off than the one the designer specifies? I've been turned off by things by tubular cast ons, for example, when it might be just as good and faster to do a long tail cast on. I agree with that to a degree. Um, a lot of people like doing um, cast ons that give you, that make your, I suppose you have a um, rib and it makes the rib go right to the edge and it's very stretchy. That's um, the German something. I don't, you'll have to look it up because I'm blanking on it um, at the moment. But I found that you can also, if you're doing a rib, I bind off in pattern. So I bind off and knit and then a purl and knit purl. So I do it, those stitches as they um, appear. The main thing I would say to you um, is, and I just mentioned this, your cast on and your bind off have to feel the same as your fabric. So that's the most critical part of a cast on and a bind off. Um, 
I would say to you to try what they usually there's a video in um, in the pattern or a reference to a video on YouTube that will show you how to do a particular um, cast on or bind off. I happen to like well, and I've worked it out so that I know how far to stretch out a stitch when I'm doing a regular bind off when I pull that do that second stitch and I'm going to take the first stitch over the second. I know how far to pull it out to make it as stretchy as the rest of the fabric. Another thing that you can do, um, because it's, it, it is critical to make it stretchy, is there's one Judy's Magic Cast On, there's Judy, Judy's Magic Cast Off, I Jenny's. can't, Jenny, Judy. You can find those on, um, they're all over YouTube. Um, but you can do one, I do one where you knit two together and then you pass the stitch on your right needle to your left and knit through the back of the next two stitches and you keep doing that and um, passing the slip, the, the stitch back to your left hand needle. Um, but to answer your question, I think it's perfectly fine to substitute if it works for you and if it looks the way the pattern should look. So don't feel like if you see some kind of cast on that seems really not your thing and you don't want to do it, I don't think you have to do it. But I think you have to do it so it works for the pattern. So you can experiment. There are a ton of them. There are books that are all cast on them, bind, off, bind offs. So you can look at those. Um, but again, YouTube is your friend. So I would look them up. Um, and then, um, this will be our last one for today. How can I purchase from your hand-dyed trunk show the last vivid color combination and the scarf pattern as I would not be able to go to your shop and like to purchase online? Well, funny that you should mention that. We've put together, this is the shawl that we had for the yarn curl, and I've since named it the Bar Harbor Shawl. And it's a combination of mohair and this merino slub. And I wore this yesterday. It was so soft. Um, it's just a delight. So we put together kits that you can now get online. And we've named them. And um, we are including the pattern with it. I'm making some, those of you who might have bought this kit during the yarn crawl, I've made some adjustments to the pattern because I think I made the mistake that a lot of people do putting it out a little too soon. I should have had several people read it, but I didn't have time. So I have some, um, you can come and get the, or I can send you the um, reformatted, um, rewritten um, pattern. So this is one we've called Lemon Lime. This has beautiful lemon yellows and lime greens. And this is one we've called kaleidoscope. So we have a bunch of these that are kaleidoscope, but we put different mohairs with them. So this is kaleidoscope iris, and we have kaleidoscope royal. This is with a navy blue, and there are all these gorgeous colors in the merino slub. I think you'll find that fun. Here's one that is called kaleidoscope pink. This beautiful, beautiful, deep pink, rosy pink. We have, this is called Cotton Candy. Look at those luscious colors. This would be a great one for somebody who's living in Florida, um, or if you start it now, you'll have it for the springtime. It's a beautiful one. We have this gorgeous blue that's kaleidoscope blue. So it's got blues and kind of teal and turquoise in it. Um, so that's a pretty one. And this one is called Cloudy Skies. And this is a gray, sorry for the crinkle, folks, um, with some turquoise and different shades of gray. And let's see, another kaleidoscope. This one's called Lime, Kaleidoscope Lime. So that, again, the kaleidoscope ones just have lots of color. Um, mostly jewel tones. And then, this is a great fall one. This one is called Golden Fleece. And uh, we have 
This one is just, I think, called pink. Fuchsia. It? Fuchsia. Fuchsia. It has no price on it, tag on it, sorry. It's called Fuchsia. This is a light and dark pink. And then we have, have a couple of these. This is called Pretty in Pink. And that's the gorgeous bubblegum pink that we love. And finally, we have one that has a name. It's called Endless Summer. This was a very popular one during the Yarn Crawl. People loved this. So, that answers that question. They're online. And um, you can get them, I think, as of today. Yeah, right now. Right now. Um, I had an, a, a tip that um, I know I've said it before, but I think it's really um, an important tip, is that you should always use stitch markers to isolate parts of your pattern. If you, um, and I always, I recommend those little light bulb ones. We're getting more in the shop. I don't have any in the shop at the moment. Well, I have them, but they haven't been received into inventory yet, but we will have them. But I like the ones that open and close sometimes because um, I can take them out. They're wonderful for counting stitches when you're casting on. You can put those in. Um, and I also like the little circle just a plain circle. And for the beginning of the round, I always like to have a pretty one. So um, Agnes, who works in the shop, was back in her um, home country of Latvia and brought back some stitch markers for me. And they have little, I don't know if they're glass, glass balls on them, but they just feel nice. It just, it's a lovely, beautifully made thing. And so you might think about having a special knit marker that you use for the beginning of the round. But if you have a border, for instance, if you have five border stitches on either end, stick a marker in there after five. And if you have, even if you have a, we had a big shawl we were doing that was knit eight, purl eight, knit eight, purl eight across. Why not throw in a stitch marker? Then if you're knitting along, you're never gonna make a mistake. And it's so easy when you're counting stitches to make a mistake. If you have a cable pattern that it's consistently in the same place, now you can't do it if something, if a pattern goes this way and then goes that way, it doesn't work. But suppose you're doing a cabled scarf or sweater, that the cable's in the same place everywhere. Throw in markers at either end, then you won't make a mistake. So use those tools, they're great. Stitch markers, you know, everybody probably has 50 in their couch. Um, so if you you don't have any, take your seat cushions off your couch and look, because I know I have them and they're, they end up on the floor and everywhere. But it's good to have a great collection and it's good to have ones that, you know, have some that you really like. So you enjoy when, like that one that I have for my beginning of the round, I have it on my sweater. And I just, Robin, could you grab my sweater and I'll just show you what I mean. So you've all seen this that I've been working on. It was going to be my Rhinebeck sweater, but I don't think I'll be finished. This is called the Paul Clay sweater. But my this is my beginning of the round marker. And I just love this little marker. So I love it when I come to it. I love flicking it over. It's just, it's nice. And it's a silly thing, but I love it. So little things that help you knit. Also, um, I would like to say about this sweater, this, this is a yarn I picked up last year at Wool & Folk um, that was held the day before the Rhinebeck, the New York State Sheep and Wool Festival. And it's a, um, it's a Romney and, um, what did they say? No, it's Merino. I take that back. But it's from a little, little company called Renninger Wool Company and they have their sheep on the label. It's so cute. But I, I um, am drifting from my um, thought. If you have a yarn, I'm enjoying this so much. And you would think, you know, you get to the end and you're dying to get to the end so you can start your ribbing and be finished. I just love this yarn so much that I'm having a really enjoyable time knitting it. And I've watched a little TV doing it and I can knit it without looking. 
it's just, it's lovely. So when you find a yarn like that, that you've enjoyed knitting with, think about doing another project. And I thought, well, if they're at Weinbeck this year or Woolen Folk, I'm going to see if they have another color of this. I might do it. Um, and Robin's saying, get me some. So anyway, stitch markers, they're great. I wanted to show you um, some patterns I saw this week on Ravelry that um, interested me. This one's called Toff Campania, or Camp Campan I don't know, C-O-M-P-A-G-N-E. But it's a cowl. And it's just, it's a fun cowl that's knit going this way. So there's short rows that make those, the pink in it. And it's done in a DK yarn. Um, but I thought that was a really fun thing. You don't need a lot of yarn, I think. Um, you could make it longer, I believe. But anyway, I thought that was fun. I saw this sweater, and I really liked this. It's called Caramelly sweater, and I loved the shoulder on this. But if you've got, if you're like me, when you go yarn shopping sometimes in a different place, you tend to buy several colors of one yarn. It makes no sense. Why I do that, I don't know. But I see colors that go together, and I think, ah, I have to have those. So if you've got in your stash a bunch of colors in the same yarn, you could do a sweater like this. But I loved the how the shoulder goes on this. You can see right in there. I just kind of thought that was a fun pattern. So that might be in my queue coming up. <coughs> and lastly, it's one um, by Natasha Hornby, and I love her patterns. And this one's called Malin, and it's a beautiful, like a sweater jacket, I think. It's almost, I think of it more as like a blazer. Um, but look it up. It's really fun. The um, One of the women from the Knitting Place has been doing it. Um, and I think she's doing it in black and white, but it has a lovely... So look it up because it has a beautiful detail here in the, the front. And I think you do it, it's done in pieces with a band at the end. But I thought that was a lovely piece. So um, I had a question about the Kitchener stitch. And there is a, as we were talking about um, cast on and bind offs, there is a uh, bind off. And I think it is done on... Andrea Mowry's Weekender, where she puts um, the, because it, it's on a ribbing, so she puts the knitting, knit stitches on one needle and the purl on the other, and you can bind off that way. Uh, she's got a video on it, but I thought I would show you, if you're doing Kitchener stitch, sometimes if you're doing a top-down sock, you're going to do a Kitchener at the end. Or um, if you're doing, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, underarm. You're doing underarm, yep, that little where you cast on stitches and you have to graft the two, um, two sides of your um, underarm. Um, what this is, it's a method of grafting, and it will... And you'll see how it, this comes out. I'm doing this on a sock that's not finished, but for demonstration purposes, I'm going to use it. So I've um, gotten my um, tapestry needle, and I've put some yarn on it. And I'm going to start. So this is my back needle, and this is my front needle. And they're sitting parallel. And I'm going to go in to the back stitch as if to purl. So thinking about knitting, it's as if you were going to purl. And I pull it part way through. Let's see. I want to leave a tail. So then I come around to the front. The yarn goes in the front, and I go in the first stitch as if to knit. And I immediately turn my needle around and go into the second stitch as if to purl. And I pull my yarn through. Give it a little tug. I go to the back, around the back, underneath. Go into the first stitch as if to purl and take it off. 
immediately turn around and go into the second stitch as if to knit and then pull my yarn through. The reason I do two at a time like that is so that I don't forget did I do both stitches and what I mean by that is you're going to be doing two at a time on the front needle and two at a time on the back needle. So I go back to the front, I've done the, the back needle, I can tell that because my yarn was over here. Oh, I take that back. I did the front needle, now I'm going to the back as if to purl. Take it off as if to knit. Leave it on. Pull the yarn through. Then I come around to the front as if to knit, take it off, and as if to purl, leave it on. So if you have a pencil and a piece of paper, you should write this down. So I go to the back needle, as if to purl, take it off. Immediately swing it around, go in as if to knit, and then pull the yarn through. And make sure you pull it underneath. So I come around to the front again, off, knit off, purl on, pull through. Give it a tug, purl off, knit on, pull through. knit off, purl on, pull through. If you do this enough times, you'll remember our mail is just being delivered. Okay. Thank you, Tammy. You're welcome. And then I go to the back, purl on, knit off, and so on to the end. And what you'll end up with is a beautifully, let's get these out of the way so you can, so you can see, I'll take these off. But what you can see is a graft, if you've done it right, I have to pull these a little tighter, of uh, just, and it looks like continuous knitting all the way around. So that's a Kitchener stitch. I recommend that you Try it, practice it, get, you know, get some yarn. It's a little bit different if you're doing it on garter, um, which I can demonstrate at some point. But this shows a nice stockinette. One last little tidbit, a little um, tip that I would recommend. Many people are monogamous knitters, and they only knit on one thing at a time, which is fine if that's your jam. I would say it's not a bad idea to have two projects. One that can be a little bit more intense, that requires a little more brain power and thought, and one that's just simple, easy knitting. Um, it's just some days you're not into um, working really hard at something, and some days it, you just want to sit down and knit. So it's nice to have a simple other project. It's also nice to have two projects because if you get stuck on one and you can't get to the yarn shop to get an answer to your question, you have something else you can pick up and knit. So I, of course, have probably 20 projects I could pick up and knit, um, which I used to be embarrassed about, but I'm not. Um, if I were an artist, I might have 20 paintings that I was working on at a time. When I was a potter, I'd have 20 pots I be, could be working on at a time. So it's to each his own. Uh, one thing that's coming up in the shop is a, I don't have the dates, I'll have them soon, is um, making a sweater that fits. So we're going to make a sweater that fits you. Um, we're going to do measurements. I'm not sure if I'm going to pick your pattern for you or I'm going to let you pick your own pattern, which might be kind of interesting because not everybody wants to make the same sweater. So. Um, I think we might do that, um, so we might even take the first class for people to pick an appropriate sweater that would look good on them. So we can talk about that. We're going to do measurements, so you're going to have your measurements. 
you should always, always, always have your measurements. Keep a notebook. This is, I have, this is my little golden book of notes, knitting notes, and I do this for the podcast. But have a notebook like this around that's got your measurements so that have your husband's measurements if you want to knit for him or, you know, the size of your head if you want to make hats. So uh, look for that coming up. It'll probably be a, be a two or three part class. Um, and it'll probably be in an afternoon. I don't know if it'll be on a Saturday. Saturdays are kind of busy in here, um, but you can give me some feedback on that if you could do a Thursday afternoon, for instance. Um, so we'll see. Anyway, it's um, fall is upon us, and it's knitting weather for sure. Oh, and I didn't mention what I have on. I'm wearing, I think it's called Big Love. And it's, um, this I made, we made in, well, I don't even think it was the recommended yarn, but somehow it worked out. This is a DK weight cotton called, I believe it's called soft cotton. We don't carry it anymore, but I've seen this made in all kinds of, um, all kinds of yarns. So it's, it's a nice, who doesn't want a cardigan? I love to have a cardigan, because first of all, if you get too, if you're hot flashing, like a lot of people are, you can take your sweater off and you can put it back on, you, you know, you can do whatever. So, and you don't have to pull it over your head and mess up your hair. So anyway, um, I hope you'll want to try this one. And I hope you have a great week of knitting and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>